this is Unpaved's episode two, and today's episode starts from the platform at Bamford Station. Bamford is just outside of Sheffield in the Hope Valley, mm. and um, it's quite a quaint little station. And absolutely freezing. <laughs> <laughs> the weather forecast hadn't looked so good for about a week out. I thought we were going to get hypothermia or something, because it was looking like minus two and torrential rain. The drive over, there was a lot of snow when we were on Snake Pass, but then when we dropped into the valley, there was quite a lot of sunshine, wasn't there? And although it was kind of bitter on the platform, like actually I was a bit reassured that the bike ride wasn't going to be um, riding in a blizzard. Do you know what Steph had said, that the Hope Valley is a bit of a microclimate? So Steph is one of the guests that we've got in the programme today. Steph's from Pania, which is a bike touring company that organised trips all over the UK and actually all over the world as well. We've got Steph on board because this episode is about route planning. So we've got Luke and Christian coming from the other side of the peak. Um, they've come over from Manchester and those guys are responsible for the second city divide route. Which is a almost entirely off-road route that you can ride between Glasgow and Manchester. And I can say from first-hand experience that it's an absolute banger. Um, they also went into business together this year um, and launched Outdoor Provisions Nutrition Brand, um, making bars with compostable wrappers and all sorts of other exciting things. We've got local legend Duncan Philpot, mountain bike photographer, and more recently gravel riding. Really fascinating bloke, so that was, yeah, good little group of us, I think. That was a really nice chat to them, and I liked the outdoor provisions. Uh, we we were carrying a Bakewell pudding. They had Bakewell tart bars, so we felt very uh, Peak District on brand. I like how you're taking credit for that. Steph was carrying a Bakewell pudding. Did I take credit for it? Yeah, you said we. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's that's not taking credit for it, is it? <laughs> I think Steph deserves full credit. That was that was really nice. He does Warming. deserve full credit. I also yeah. liked riding next to Steph because in his frame bag I could hear the um, metal cups and his stove kind of clanking along yeah. as we were going. And you know what, that is a very important thing to emphasise inside his frame bag. <laughs> no dangling on this trip. I think that's probably my favourite part of the whole episode actually. But you'll get onto that later. Yeah, we end on that bit of a... Dang- Controversial dang- issue. Yeah, yeah, Touchy yeah. subject. For anyone that doesn't know, dangling is dangling a mug off of a of a bag somewhere on your bike basically. I don't think I've ever asked you. Are you are you dangle or anti dangle? Oh, um well, do you know what? This episode's definitely put me off. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um I have dangled. On a practical level, it is just really handy because quite often you can't fit a big tube into your bag very easily. And I also ride with a caradise bag. And it's got like little buckly straps, which are just perfect for putting through the handle of a mug. So it's kind of inviting you to do it. But the pockets on the side of it are also the exact size of most of those mugs. So you can kind of yeah. put them in and then just pack everything inside it, which a is... A pair um, of pants or some socks or something. Yeah, a pair of pants in your Easy mug is uh, <laughs> good if they're clean. So I'm kind of sitting on the fence with it a little bit. Mm. I think I, we should do like a poll or something. See how many of our listeners are... Pro versus anti dangle. The dangle pole to rival doodle pole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. It's let's like set it up. Bike packing's number one question. I mean, obviously, it's a really obvious question to answer. Because. Because. <laughs> because I don't want to get the shits from. <laughs> don't from give it away. From... <laughs> okay, sorry. No. But why is it so it. obvious to be so anti dangle? Because you just get a filthy mug and then you got to drink out of it. Ugh. Yeah. Just pack your bags better, really. If it's inside. <laughs> right, anyway, let's get we're going. We're getting a bit sidetracked. So we'll we'll let everyone introduce themselves, and then um, yeah, you're going to hear us set off on the ride round Lady Bar. There's also Dam Flask Reservoir and Howden. I think it's the third one, and then we kind of loop back, and after the ride, you'll hear a sort of longer chat where we sit down in the pub. Yeah, and don't forget that you can go and do this ride yourself as well. We're going to have all of the routes from every episode of Unpaved on our Commute account. And if you haven't heard of Commute before, it's a route planning and navigation app. So that ties in really nicely to this episode because we're talking about how you plan really great off-road routes. And that's just a really great tool for it, especially with the algorithms that mean that you can choose uh, either mountain biking or gravel riding or road, depending on what kind of flavour of rides you're into. So hopefully you'll come on this ride with us and if you get inspired then you can obviously download the route but you can also have a little go at trying to see what it comes up with in your local area if you fancy going out on a ride after this. Um, so let's let's get going. Let's do it. 
Here comes the train. I'm Luke, one of the founders of Second City Divide and more recently Outdoor Provisions from the Manchester side and first time I've ever met Steph from Panya CC. I've been followed him for ages. <laughs> I'm Christian, so I'm the other half of Outdoor Provisions and Second City Divide as well. I also live over in Manchester with Luke, not in the same house. That would be pretty bad. My name is Dundee on Talkpot. I'm a photographer of most things outdoors. Kind of transitioned more into this style of cycling from the World Cup downhill cross country uh, race scene, um, which used to be where I started before. I I'm Steph, one half of Pannier CC, bikepacking and adventure cycling tour company. So, what have you got planned for us today, Steph? So, we're in the Peak District in the Dark Peak area. Quiet roads, gravel tracks, proper mountain bike territory if you head towards Hope in Hope Valley. But we're going to do basically heading on the Thornhill Trail out to the first of three reservoirs. We'll do skirt around the Lady Bower, Howden and Derwent. Um, they're kind of famous from early 1900s when they were built to provide loads of water for further south towards Nottingham. Super nice quiet road and then the East Banks gravel tracks all the way around and from there you can end up back in the top end of Bamford village there's a community pub there so we're going to stop there and you say peak rather than the peaks which was very early nipped in the bud in my first email to you <laughs> only, why why is that only because i i was calling it that and then loads of people kept telling me it was the peak the peak early on dark peak early on so i got it nipped in the bud yeah because there aren't really many peaks. Mam Tor is probably the only typically peaky peak there is. Kinder's the high point, but it's it's kind of a plateau, so it's nice rolling. It, you know, nothing here is as epic as some of the other national parks, but you know, it's got a nice escape factor and it's stunning and high enough to get out and have an adventure on the bike. It's certainly testing on the legs, all those hills, though. Yeah, definitely. It's the original national park as well. It's the first to fall. It's where they started with the mass trespass. First mass trespass was up onto Kinder to protest against land ownership and stuff. And then shortly after that, the government formed the national parks. The peak was the first one, followed by the lakes and all the other ones. So it's like the OG of national parks. And it's the most visited park by all yeah. accounts just because of its central location to Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield, Nottingham, Derby and it's kind of accessible from all over, which is, makes it a cool, a cool point. And for us, we had the Sheffield and Manchester contingent, so it kind of made sense to meet on the famous slow train line between the <laughs> two, halfway in the Hope Valley. So, yeah. Let's go. So what have you been doing sort of in the lead up to starting Pannier? What were you doing when you were Steph before you were Steph and one half of Pannier? <laughs> so grew up in Croydon and came to Sheffield to study architecture and worked as an architect for five or six years in London. Um, yeah, you got into cycling from being in Sheffield in the peak really while studying, playing a lot of rugby and cycling was there, a new form of getting out and about and ex you know, fitness, so a lot of road riding, had like an entry level giant road bike that I loved getting out, used to do a round to Chatsworth and back which was nice to do at the weekend and then a long tour doing lands in John O'Groats changed, changed the way I thought about riding bikes. Three of us, me and two good mates, Luke and Danny, didn't really know what we were doing, kind of waterproofing stuff with bin bags on the back of our racks, sleeping in pub beer gardens in tents. Yeah, and we just lived the free life for 12 days, I think it took us. Um, so how did it change everything? 
Just saw the, the freedom and the leisure aspect of riding bikes as opposed to the kind of riding for fitness or whatnot on the road. Um, we still weren't really riding anything unpaved, obviously, at that point. But yeah, it's that slow travel aspect that still is at the heart of what I kind of try and do today, whether, even when we're racing. <laughs> There's always a slow element to it. And yeah, started vlogging about our travels and taking people on trips from about 2010, 2011. And it's slowly developed into what it is today in 2020. And we've got a full calendar of uh, trips and tours planned in for this year. So. What I really like about the look of the trips, I've never been on one, is that they are something which you could book thinking, I want an adventure holiday. But it seems like it's as much about teaching skills and confidence so people can do it themselves. Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely the case, whether intentional or not. Yeah, we get a whole range of folk on one of our trips. Last year was the first year we kind of ran quite a few trips and had a lot of people coming through which is great I mean that's one of the main things I still enjoy what I'm doing is meeting everyone taking people and hosting people out in cool places but yeah they range from people who are super experienced bikepackers and just want to come along for the social or the group aspect if they maybe don't know a lot of people who do the same stuff People who ride out the puddles. <laughs> Never done anything like it before. Uh, maybe they're fell runners or outdoorsy people already and uh, looking at trying something new or um, ride, on, ride a lot of road and are interested in this new mass niche form of riding bikes, the whole gravel adventure side of things so hopefully we're a bit of a gateway and it's, it's quite nice to hear back from people that have been on a trip maybe like a month or three months later who've maybe then gone and bought a bike and some bags and they're going and doing stuff themselves but what's really nice is that even if that is the case they'll generally come back on another trip you know yeah there's there's arguments that you know when we're promoting what we're doing the, the general public, there's always people who say, oh, you know, they're public, why would you not just go and do it yourself? And I'm a huge advocate for both, like, that's how I got into it and I still go off and do it. Anyone who emails us about a trip and says, what route's that, can I have it? I'll happily help them out and point them where we go. And, and actually it's quite a nice collaborative collaborative process where they're like oh yeah that looks great I can I can see where you you're going on that map or that mapping app and and they'll they'll effectively plot it themselves with my help so if people know where the nearest towns are from plotting it themselves or whatnot then that's that's great. Do you know what that edge is that's where I'm right now? So on the right is Bamford Edge that one right. and it's the grit stone that Climbers around the world all come to visit. It's weird, you'll be at one of the big alpine peaks in a hut. And someone will be like, oh yeah. Off to climb the north face of it. And they'll be like, oh yeah, I know Stunnage. I go there a lot and it's like, Stunnage is tiny. Morning. Well, the remains of the village that they built to build the dam. Yeah. <laughs> this was a bustling village at one point. Wow. You just take it for granted when you have running water in a city. You don't think about where that's come from and what impact that's had on people. Yeah, yeah. It's the same with that desert Wales stuff, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. That's Elan Valley. Birmingham water, yeah. isn't it? Out that way. Yeah. You were talking about how you plan routes before. If your one bit of route planning or trip generation is basically stay away from roads, it leads to a, the best form of route generation because you're trying to connect places 
with tracks or paths or loads of unpaved stuff and that's what leads to the interesting trips and escape routes basically. When you first started doing it how did you start that process? Well when I was first doing this sort of stuff I was a map geek anyway it was an OS map thing Google Maps, Camus, all these apps and GPS things weren't weren't a thing especially in my world. Pink 1 to 50,000 map you'd basically pick out the yellow the yellow roads and dotted tracks Bef early on I wasn't doing everything off-road so the off-road stuff's probably only been three or four years but yeah it was a case of digging out all the yellow roads and then where you can't get to where you want to go trying to link up the dotted tracks and bridleways you can pretty much guarantee that will lead to a nice route I'd say and then check the contours obviously <laughs> I always, yeah. always forget to check the contours it's one of those things that you learn you learn when you go, don't you? Yeah. You make a mistake once and then you know what you're looking out for next time. I think that's one of the things on route planning, like you've got to be prepared to have a bit of a shit ride or something go wrong and not be right. Because it's constant refinement as well if you've got to do that. And you will, yeah, you'll have bad times. Like you might have seen the picture of Luke's just done a Second City Defied uh, Edinburgh link up basically. And he was out in the Pentlands doing that the other day and he's like walking through knee high cow shit. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the reality that's the reality of uh, that's the reality of route fettling. I think the biggest like experience factor for route planning is for me is now turned into not just route generation but working out what a group of unknown people might be able to get round or making stuff accessible for people that you might not know because anyone can sort of book on our trips we we Dave and I ask a few questions and get a bit of information to make sure everything's right but they are designed as accessible adventures so we always know people can get around them they might be challenging for some super challenging for others or kind of nice riding for others but pit stops along the way and it's kind of knitting together a route that has stops around lunch like snack stops or sheltered spots where people can regroup so it's not just the route anymore from it's a lot it's a lot about resupply connecting stuff and yeah and if stuff goes wrong for example us getting out of it that's another big big factor so you know if you come on a anything sort of pannier or organized by me recently it's, it's got all those factors at play it's not it's not just a, a simple way to be that. and hopefully those are things that you'll never actually have to see or yeah, understand yeah. but it's really important to have those yeah, emergency yeah. exit routes and i think that's what it's become now just thinking about those other things as well and i think that really you, you learn about a place so well just from plotting your own route and, and we're saying seeing contours and someone will be like oh that bit you said there that looks awful and you're like, yeah, but yeah, it is. But, <laughs> but um, I sent you up there anyway. There's, there's, <laughs> but the accommodation's just over the hill or yeah. there's a village there or a pub. And someone will say, that was a really good one the other week about the Lake District and the guy was like, oh, down from Thirlmere to Grassmere, that's the main road, and I was, which is what you basically say, avoid main roads. So he spotted that and I was like, no, it's fine. It's all downhill, it's really wide, it's fine. So, you know, that's that collaborative process of yeah. route planning so on a map that actually looks looks a bit naff but it's fine in re real life so when did you first get the idea to start trying to connect up Glasgow and Manchester the UK's two most glamorous yeah. cities <laughs> it probably um, was born out of so the, the the trip we did that gave us the idea was um, well the two trips were Badger Divide so doing Inverness to Glasgow which we actually didn't make it the whole way out with the bail at the end that and Torino Nice Rally which were incredible trips but just took quite a lot of logistics especially the Torino Nice one it was worth it because you get to ride through the Alps but you had like a day and a half or even two days of travel either side or the way we did it you did anyway but we liked the idea of riding city to city on a big A to B trip, that was kind of super exciting and linking together lots of nice parts. We kind of had an inkling of areas that we liked and a couple of like belting stretches that we'd seen. So like Salterfell Road, which is this sort of 
12k section in Lancashire so we knew that wanted to be in it and we knew that there was the Cam High Road bit in Yorkshire uh, straight out of Ribblehead that we wanted to link and then these bits in the borders that I'd ridden so they kind of they already were in place and then from looking at maps after that we went and found even better or as good places in between but not first try we had to go and uh, we did a lot of wrecking um, a lot in winter and stuff to kind of test and actually you rule out a lot of stuff it's like we got into riding these kind of I don't want to keep calling them gravel bikes or adventure bikes but the kind of riding whereby you weren't you were actively looking to avoid roads or certainly busy roads because there's plenty of good B roads on this some of the best bits are some of these like hidden B roads but it was to um, really hit the kind of wild places and uh, use the kind of high volume tyres and the fact that you had your gear with you to be a bit further away from civilization and stuff, which you, in the Scottish bit you definitely are. There's quite big stretches between resupply. If we went anywhere that we thought was great, we put that down as like a point of interest because it's useful to know what time it opens and is it seasonal and what kind of stuff you can rely on getting. How long did it take to do it in a one -off? Uh, it was six hard days, like probably harder than we wanted to. But like I say, it's, been, it's got a little bit more refined since then. So uh, I think still think six days is a good time to do it in. Uh, Steve Bates, the Paralympian, absolutely battered it in about two and a half days. But he, he also did like a 38 hour riding day <laughs> to do that. So um, depends what time of year you'd go and what kind of how you want to stay. Because you. You could do the whole of Second City staying in B&Bs if you wanted to. Like, it goes through enough places. Well, you might struggle in Scotland, but um, if you're going kind of fairly light and fast but have enough stuff to sleep in, I think that four, five, six day mark is perfect for like, Second City. And like I say, it champions UK exploration, UK riding, UK bikepacking, which is so diverse. Like, you go through so many different landscapes, areas, accents in, in 600k, it's so diverse, you've got like, you get hints of Geordie when you're over at Kielder, you've got Manc, you've got thick, thick Lancastrian, a bit of Cumbrian through the Pennines, then into like Scottish borders and hard Glaswegian at the other end of it, and there's loads of like a big mix of food as well, there's just so much more than just going and riding your bike this the things that it can open you up to a bit of because you go over Hadrian's walls there's like a massive bit of British his, history and culture there you could stop and spend a day there if you wanted to uh, there's a, that new Sill hostel on Hadrian's wall it's like one of the newest YHAs which is a great stop off place it, I think there's about six YHAs on the route which is another great accommodation option you're supposed to ride at Glasgow to Manchester but then Catherine's done it the other way and taking a load of nice photos whoever wants to ride it Manchester to Glasgow now. Is that a bit annoying? Not really. <laughs> uh, just though mainly because we like the name Glasman. We started talking about the Glasman as a bit of a mythical beast that hunts dangle mugs and uh, loads of people have taken that on now so I've heard all sorts of stories about people's encounters with the Glasman uh, now to the point where I'm not even sure if he is real or not. Does he hide under bridges like a troll? Yeah they, that, that is one story I've heard yeah. Loves, loves, loves mucky, misty, pennine weather. Yeah, extremely dangerous. Do not approach. Maybe he's misunderstood, actually. I don't know. I really enjoyed the coffee stop halfway round, which Steph laid on for us in true pannier touring fashion I don't think I've ever been so grateful oh this makes me sound like a total snob I don't think I've ever been so grateful for a hot mug of instant coffee <laughs> um, it was just the way he had you know his bike there with a full frame bag and then all of a sudden out of nowhere like this whole Bakewell pudding comes out and it's still warm from the bakery down his road in the morning and it was yeah absolutely delicious that was so good because it was about freezing point but with the wind chill it was sort of minus two minus three and I don't remember the last time I did a whole ride with my insulated puffer jacket on and a waterproof. That was really bloody cold. <laughs> just come down to this little stone bridge. Just a little bit up from 
Lady Bow Reservoir on Derwent. And as you can probably hear, Steph is cooking us up a brew, which is much needed because it's a little bit freezing on the extremities. We've been sort of tracking around the edge of the reservoir as it goes into the valleys. And um, on one side, it will be lovely and beautiful in the sun because it's not actually that cold on that side. But then you go on to the other side of the, of the reservoir valley and it's, yeah, there's still snow all over the place and freezing, biting wind. So I think we're all ready for a nice warm drink. And Steph's actually got a Bakewell pudding for us, which is a very authentic Peak District fair, which looks, um, I was going to say it looks really appetising, but the way he's peeling the foil off. It looks a bit <laughs> like a quiche with almonds on it at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Do you often have coffee outside midway through your rides? Or are we the exception? Basically always got coffee making apparatus <laughs> on me at all time. Um, Along with your survival bag and your tools. And yeah, your first aid kit, coffee making, pen. Ooh, why the pen? Maybe sketching stuff, I don't know. It's a bit too fast paced this ride though, isn't it? <laughs> So is this, this a Bakewell tart? No, this is a Bakewell pudding, importantly. Yeah. Um, just softer and more almondy Go without the in. icing. Somebody stick a hand in. So they, they go for it, they. Mm. Oh my god! Is it still sort of warm? That's great. Mm. Mm. Is it warm? Yeah, it's warm. Yeah, yeah. It's How would you describe the flavour and the no, texture right of it? Bakewell pudding, not tart. Mm. Um, I think with the Bakewell tart, with the icing layer and the cherry, you get the almond flavour, and often it's got that line of sort of uh, cherry jam almost as well. As well, but the almond flavour doesn't have the same like uh, sort of richness as we've got going on in here, and also the tart is a little bit more cakey. Whereas that's a bit more like a treacle tart. Mm, it's incredibly mm, sweet, but also that. moist. Yeah. And yet the pastry is still mm. dry and crunchy. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how they do that. It's, really it's very good. It's, um, yeah. Who wants a hand warmer? South, uh, south you look chilly. Of, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to be yeah. polite about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> how do you distill a Bakewell tart into a bar? <laughs> Eat a lot of Bakewell tarts, first of all. Um, <laughs> all our bar flavours, there's like probably two key elements in their original foods they try and pick out so we've got a lot of almonds in there some really nice um, like freeze-dried sour cherries but there's a debate on whether it should be cherry or raspberry for bake oil as well so oh. is the original cherry or it's raspberry? raspberry I think the original is it we've, we've got a uh, couple of visitors we've got two ducks literally like a meter away just looking quite eager for yeah. yeah. We're not the first people here, are we? It's a popular stop off spot for when all the geese and stuff migrate through. And you just turn up one day <laughs> and it's <there's> hundreds <laughs> everywhere. I thought you were going to say a popular picnic spot, and this is why oh, they've, God, they've come to get all the crumbs. Ducky duckies! <laughs> I'll give this one. <laughs> we stopped at what people would know as the Slippery Stones Bridge. It's kind of a nice plunge pool on the Derwent, peaty water plunge pool um, and it's kind of the dead end on a gravel bike, uh, the end of the two reservoirs and then we loop all the way back round the eastern bank back towards Bamford and that's where the gravel, so we've just done nice quiet roads, bit of gravel and then now it's gravel all the way back. Uh, feels kind of wild for where it is considering where it is but yeah it's nice kind of is a dead end and what not for us so yeah time to head back yeah. right so it's gravel now there's a couple of Yo. gates to st stop us but...
So like all good rides, we're finishing in the pub. We're in the Angler's Rest, um, which is quite appropriate because we've got Duncan with us, who's a very, very keen fisherman, <laughs> if that's the term, angler, um, and just enjoying a few pints whilst we wait for our um, fish finger butties. So we're at the end of the ride today, but I'd really be interested to know, Steph, how you go about planning a ride like this one that we've done today and what sort of things you take into account when planning that. I think a big part of riding bikes and the slow travel vibe that we try and recreate is also the time off the bike. So today it was a case of thinking about a couple of scenic nice sheltered picturesque places to stop and brew up, get people warm again places where there's water so technically next to rivers that's also a pretty good a pretty good thing that I look out for if we're planning a, a lunch stop or something even if it's just for like washing washing stuff at the end um, but yeah having water for hot drinks um, getting people warm again and that was kind of half <laughs> sorry there's a piano recital happening <laughs> um, is there actually? Like, just there is a group. Yeah, I think it's the local choir having yeah. their practice. Oh man, yeah. they do requests. Sometimes there's natural points in a ride when you'll stop, and today was one of them. Everyone was pretty cold actually. I borrowed Catherine's gloves. I thought I'd be able to get away with it. Um, but everyone was cold, and it was the right point to stop and enjoy it a bit um, I would never we... normally think about a water point either because I'm not normally carrying cooking equipment unless <laughs> I'm touring so um, yeah that's that's a really nice thing to bear in mind yeah the off the bike stuff for me is just almost just as important as, as the riding so I think yeah. your trips are possibly just the, the best experience I think that's the best way of summarising it. Like, really good roots and all that, but I've come away with some of my favourite camp food that I've ever tried, like some of the curries and things like that. They're just absolute winners, and there's always loads of little memorable uh, additions sort of outside of just the cycling. And I always notice if you're somewhere else and you're getting, you know, you're, you seem always very keen to take on the hospitality of guys from other sorts of bit hiking, trekking, you know, mountaineering side of things, and always picking up on the individual tips and tricks, like their traits oh, and all yeah. that, and incorporating that then into the pannier side of things. So you have like nice aspects that are, lifting, are fairly think, unique. Lifting yeah. it from others, I think, is the, <laughs> <laughs> not lift the technical term. <laughs> Adapting and adopting. <laughs> I guess it's those things as well that really help when you're um, taking a group out of people that might not all know each other. The friendships probably really start to gel at those moments. Yeah, and it, people enjoy getting stuck in. You know, we were talking earlier about that educational aspect um, and learning a couple of little things that they might then take on their next trip, whether it's a way to make a hot drink or using a different stove or working out which stove is more packable than the others, where they can carry all their stuff. Like today, I just lobbed everything in a frame bag quickly but when you've got more stuff that process of packing and working out where the best place for stuff is is, is takes a lot of getting used to as everyone around the table knows <laughs> even the term bike packing is not even that well recognized so when you're talking about giving someone at the start of a trip if someone's hired bags you might leave a pile of seat packs frame bags and bar bags and you've you've kind of got to expect them to have never fitted them to a bike so there'll be that process of learning how to use a new new type of bag um, how to fit it how to pack it and avoiding bag sag which is the <laughs> how do you avoid bag sag avoiding bag sag <laughs> is experience based um, structural experience. umbrellas <laughs> There's yeah, nothing sadder than bag sag. <laughs> <laughs> Witness first hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you were saying about bikepacking being a relatively undefined term. What would it what does it mean to you? If someone if someone who didn't know what bikepacking was, didn't know what this mass niche of gravel riding was, didn't know what adventure cycling was, you could say it's backpacking with a bike. I think I think that's the best way of describing it for me because kind of denotes travelling that's what it's about it's always about that, that kind of overnight aspect 
and carrying everything that you need to have a good time out on the bike and that's what differs for everyone really for me I like to have a certain set of equipment on me for others they'll go and do the same tour I'm doing but with literally nothing so I think that's how it varies it's the comfort levels um, and what you get out of it that define what type of bike packer you are um, so yeah I'd definitely take the heavier <laughs> more comfort level type but at a couple of events last year like Silk Road it was a case of really stripping back what I needed and redefining what bikepacking was for me they're testing a few ideas out I'm quite happy to now revert back to the leisure <laughs> side of bikepacking now, now we've finished that kind of need the same amount of stuff whether you're going out overnight like you guys did in the cold of Oxford as you do you could you could have that same amount of kit on your bike and go away for much longer definitely if you're looking for the more unpaved stuff the new form of setup is the way to go really and it's about adjusting to how how you can carry what you need to carry and what you you shouldn't carry because that experience then tells you oh I didn't use that I don't need that yeah you work out what you need and you don't need you don't need three merino base layers for a, a two-day trip, let alone a week. So what would be your go-to pieces of kit that you never go on tour or, or bike pack without? I've decided I'm not a bivvy person. So I would take a small tent. There's loads of ways I've now got used to splitting it up, which will work. So rather than looking at a tent as a big single item, splitting that up onto fork bags, poles can go in the frame bag and, and whatnot. So I'm always a, always a tent person. Cookware and stuff to make, drinks and food, that's also a big important aspect. Working out what stoves and cookware works for you. Sporks are massively important, mugs. And then off, off the bike, down jacket's a critical bit of kit. And gloves as we worked out today. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, looking at it from a riding perspective and an off bike perspective, off the bike I'd always have down jacket, gloves like some sort of polar techie legging to wear off the bike to keep you warm warm socks uh, sleeping bag or quilt um, and a pillow a pillow is the newest best thing ever um, it's before you <laughs> no, it's one of those experiencing again because there's a there's only so much sleep you can get when you've got your head against a wet pair of shoes or um, inflated dry bag, which is a good tip for anyone if you if you do need a pillow, blowing into a dry bag and then sealing up is quite a nice pillow. But a, a, an actual outdoor inflatable pillow is cha has totally changed my sleep when I'm outdoor. And yeah, that makes a big difference because you're fresh, ready for the next day. Snack-wise, definitely some sort of tonics material <laughs> um, and outdoor provisions. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, food and drink supplies for the amount of time we do. I, wherever we're going, if we're going to Scotland or wherever, always try and research a local one-pot meal to try and cook when we're there. So that that always forms a bones of some sort of recipe or or ingredients list whether it's cullen skink or a bosnian stew it all that kind of informs what we'll cook and then yeah sketchbook and pens always like making notes and sketching and sometimes you need to not rely on a phone for that sort of thing so you talked a little bit there about camping out when you're camping, do you find it's best to plan where you're going to be and when? Or do you think that flexibility is a bit more important? That would massively depend on what sort of trip it was. If we're, for example, we're going to the Picos in Spain in February and that's like semi-planned as to where we're going to be, not to the exact spot. Well, what would you, what, I'm, I'm going to turn that back around. Oh. What would you look for? <laughs> um, I guess this is something that I've learned through as you say, sort of getting it wrong yeah. or getting, being very sneaky. Like when God we were in Oxford, God. camping under the trees and in the morning you could see a really hard frost in the open area. Looking at the cloud cover overnight, 
will tell you how warm it's going to be or you know BBC yeah. weather app <laughs> yeah. um, somewhere sheltered somewhere that's not too close to the water if you're in high summer and there's midges and things like that as you said I would look for somewhere semi-sheltered um, by a river but ro not right next to it it's quite nice having what's, some water what's the worst place that you've <laughs> camped 100% I know exactly where this is without even <laughs> thinking about it. Um, it was, uh, we were on a moor. We made a, we did a film trip in a few years ago in north of Scotland, which we called Beulah, which is up to Cape Wrath. And um, I was already nervous because I was with Will, who you met on your last podcast, uh, from brother Jordan and Luke. And I could just tell Luke and Jordan were flagging a bit. It was quite late and the weather was right at this point, but we just headed up into this dead end valley with no shelter whatsoever. Jordan fell in the river. Luke was like ready to go and find the nearest train station. <laughs> and we ended up like camping basically on a, on a floating bog thing. And it stormed and it was, it was horrendous. I think that's, that's another point of these. If you're taking, or if you're, there's a mental pressure of being responsible, I guess, if you're someone who's planned a route. And that was a night when I was like, "Oh, this is this is bad. Um, <laughs> this is never this is never this is never going to happen again." Um, yeah, we tried to cook some sausage. It just it was tried to cook some sausages. It was just like nothing was working out. We went. Yeah, everyone just tried to go to sleep at about eight o'clock in a bog, and it was. It was just miserable. You've done a lot of touring, not only in the UK, but all over Europe as well, both on your own or with Pannier. How does that compare? And do you think the UK is more or less accessible than those places for, say, introduction to bikepacking? <laughs> We're far denser here in the UK population-wise, so yeah. it's, uh, it's almost easier to go do your first foray of a local loop because... It's, everything's quite widely documented because there's a lot of voices on the same stuff. There's always amenities nearby, as you said. But then you go into Europe and the possibilities are almost endless. Mm. You know, there's massive tracts of land through alpine regions, through mountains, which are probably quite imposing for your first time if you're not like, if you're not an experienced sort of person or aware of like hot networks or how all that sort of stuff works. And you know, your resupply could actually be a full day's ride away which makes it quite tricky and <laughs> we found out the hard way on one of our trips when we left the national park trying to it was your last story reminded me trying to find somewhere to sleep we just come out of a huge national park and it was straight into competitive agricultural land because you know the land is suddenly available for that kind of use and that's all it was and there was like one wooded copse and like the, we could see it in the distance so we, we made our way towards that and uh, it was nightfall as we got there this was winter in spain and um Turned out there was someone hunting and they let us know of a lovely warning shot and like we'd interrupted someone's hunt. They, they were definitely disgruntled and not law abiding in the way that they were going about letting us know. And um, so we kind of ran off with tails between our legs all white as a sheet and ended up, there was nothing around and snuck into a cattle shed on one of the farms <laughs> to sleep the night. And then you don't sleep properly because you just think that the same disgruntled farmer that's shot you is just going to turn up any second now and you know, you don't sleep all night. But you know, it was warm and dry and it was. Christmas Eve, Eve in a cattle shed, so no immaculate conceptions, thankfully, as well. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends where you go. If you want something really wild and remote, then you can get pretty lost in Scotland very no. easily. I think the unpaved thing is key for this really finding wilderness, or what feels like wilderness and escape, especially in the UK. There aren't many places left that you don't see anyone or really feel remote or, or lost. And that's why we did focus on the, the Desert of Wales trip because, I mean, that in terms of accessibility to get to start and finish points, that, that, that area of the Elam Valley and Mid Wales is, is really special for that. Um, because, even, yeah, after what I've just said, but even a lot of the roads are, are not visited. And it, it really feels 
like the middle of nowhere. And that's, I think that's what people are seeking. It's just, and it's, a still, lot to it's still a human influence because somebody's mm. put it there, but it yeah. feels a lot less 21st century than a, a tarmac road, I guess. Yeah, and that, well, that's what, if we're going back to the Europe thing, that's the interesting and the hard bit about it because all of that amazing route infrastructure, a lot of which we've ridden, is basically their military and in Scotland, they're all military influence roads and networks. So good has come of bad almost. And, you know, they're things like our bunker, bunker tour in the south of France with Max Leonard really opened my eyes to that and how important that military road building process has been for opening up and unlocking the mountains for cyclists. My, mountain biking is slightly different because you're open to a, all that. I'm thankful for donkeys. Yeah. <laughs> in mountain biking, you can tell what's an old donkey trail when you're in the Alps because like, you just know as soon as it gets steep, it switches back at a radius of. Well, like the hiking trails, they switch back too tight to be very flowy, but if it was an old donkey track for lugging stuff, the switchback would be just open enough to hold plenty of speed. And they're really common in certain tracks of the Alps and you can be riding along and then you know, oh, you can see it's dipping away from you and then the corners almost follow like a predefined format and you're like, oh, it's probably an old donkey track. <laughs> it's uh, amazing how the old, that's like um, Ash Smith who organizes Transprovence and just has archaic maps of old land uses, old, be like he's the Sospel Valley where he used to live and you know there'll be like oh there used to be a terrace here 400 years ago which means there's a path to the terrace and they go and reopen a path because it's still there cut through the rock and everything like that and you know getting off wheels across it and a new trail is opened um, like you say with the gravel bike and it's mostly moving vehicles to get something of that width around which was pretty much war on that and I think events like Torino Nice have you know a lot of the Italian French sort of front to thank for all of their route and how important do you think an appreciation for the landscape that you're in, whether it's where these trails have originated from or, you know, when the Bothies were built and, and why? Do you think that's important to people that are passing through them? I mean, I find it interesting. Just mention that bunker trip that Max helped organise and that, that was fascinating. The process of building these huge bunker infrastructures in the mountains is just incredible. And so then riding the routes that they use to to build them and transport personnel and everything up and down them and resupply uh, it's not just the building of them it's the the logistics of how they were used as well back in the day like that I find that really interesting um, yeah shuttling up food supplies and crepes and all whatever they used to take up <laughs> Uh, baguette. <laughs> yeah. uh, Escargot. Escargot, yeah. I just find it so interesting and it's such a contrast to the cycling mania that we've had in the UK that's, you know, road cycling, go as fast as you can, what's FTP? And it's just such a contrast. It's about like exploring where you are, the history, like you said, the wildlife and and I think the more that you understand about the impact that you're having and what you're taking, the more you respect it and actually change the way you behave. I think it takes a, a trip, whether you're riding, hiking, whatever you're doing, spending time outdoors and surviving is, is, a, is a huge learning curve on that front. Um, I mean, even <laughs> the big thing on Silk Road was two sheets a day like rations like it sounds silly but that's how much you needed so that's how much you stocked up no i we well different days were different um but it it's it's a thing where it's that's that you learn that that is what you, the minimum you need to to get by and what you actually need um versus what's just nice to have so we've spoken a little bit about your tours with pannier but i think it's from an outsider's perspective, or even having been on one of your tours, it's so much more than just bike packing tours. Can you tell us a little bit about the philosophy behind Pannier and where it's come from and what you really think it is today? We've coined this 15 kilometers an hour club. And the feedback so far has been positive in that people understand that that evokes a sort of slow travel. 
uh, appreciation of riding bikes. In in reality, it, we probably even the trips probably even end up being less than that. Probably like five <laughs> to ten. Um, I remember the morning we got when we got off the train to snow in Italy, and we didn't expect it to be snowing, and we we're really cold, and we we're absolutely tanning it. And our average speed was 15 kph, and we felt like we were tanning it. <laughs> and we were like, oh, this is probably not the best 15 kph I've had because it was just like deep snow. <laughs> and we were like so working and working. Uh, it's so subjective because I remember when I came on Ruby Ramble last uh, March, and I was amazed because we got to the end of the day, and the first day was pretty big. And it miles. was. It's a century it was, ride, yeah. Yeah, it was 15 kph, and I was like, well, I don't feel like we've been riding slow, but obviously it's mixed surface, and then you're like stopping and chatting and like having a little snack and things. So it, it didn't feel overly fast or overly slow. It was just that sort of sweet spot touring place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think you nailed it. It is, it is a sweet spot, and some trips, whatever trip you're doing, you, lot, you, you pretty much end up around that. Uh, but it's, if you're talking about planning routes or planning trips for the first time, it's probably a good benchmark to go off in terms of what you're capable of distance-wise. Um, yeah, so base your trips on doing 15 kilometres an hour, if you like stopping and riding at a normal speed anyway. Um, but yeah, pan yeah, we've talked a bit about the off-the-bike stuff as as well as on the bike. It's If I see bikes as much more of a tool for experience, I think that probably shows in the, in the pannier stuff. So it's accessible, challenging adventure. I think from a personal perspective, we chatted a couple of years ago when I was really struggling to find like-minded people to go on these sorts of rides with. And we were talking, you know, should we make some sort of forum or some way of getting, I don't know, like young professional or non-professional, whoever it is. Um, I was single at the time and was like looking for just mates. I didn't have anyone really in my area that wanted to do these sorts of things. Um, one of the things that struck me most about Root Beer Ramble was just bringing in these collection of people from all over that area or even the UK and beyond who are like-minded to get together. And then it's not just what happens on that trip, it's what goes beyond. And I've kept in touch and actually really good mates with a lot of people from that tour. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think you're helping to facilitate that, mm. which is really incredible. It's more than just going on a tour, it's building this off-road community. Yeah, that's our aim. And I think that's the difference between the kind of three, four day trips that might not appeal to some people that come on the weekend stuff. And it's really, one of the main reasons why we try and do the overnight short weekend trips because A, that's what a lot of people have time for and they're a lot more accessible. So you can get, we talked a lot about wild places and going in search of escape, but the Root Beer Ramble last year really hit home <laughs> to us that actually just a really nice city to city trip with a group of people's fun and people want to do it and this this year in March there'll hopefully be 60 70 people doing it this year and that'll hopefully roll on and yeah get more people knowing about each other and knowing about unpaved bike packing um, <laughs> that's what keeps us going is meeting people and then People who may have hired a bike and some bags to start with on one of our trips and then they'll message in like two months and they'll have a bike and some bags and going and doing their own stuff. That's really cool. That's cool to see. That's what we want to see. And then they will still come on other trips that we do because it is about that group and social aspect and bringing people together, whether it's... 15 people on one of our normal trips or 50 people on a more relaxed weekend experience so yeah well I've got an important question are you a dangler or not <laughs> <I'm> a <laughs> do you dangle Mug? I did I've stopped oh, I've stopped yes. dangling <laughs> um, I've stopped you dangling <laughs> <laughs> It's really hard to say in public this. Um, no, Dave actually got really ill on Silk Road. We think it was from a dangled mug. So, yeah. Oh, I'm going to use that as So watch every out. Every time I watch see somebody dangling kids. now. My watch friend was on kids. Silk Road. Yeah, no, I think we think it was, and yeah. 
there is there is a good argument for stuff like I started dangling people will always say like you you've just got stuff all over your bike and that's literally just because I can't fit it yeah. in the bags I've got yeah. so there's an argument for that and mugs are annoying things to pack in a seat pack or whatever so there is rationale for it but I have to, I have changed my tune <laughs> there was no dangling today no, I noticed. Um. Confessions of a bangler. So that's a wrap on episode two. Been riding around the Hope Valley with Steph, Dunk, Luke and Christian, even in the snow. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was really cold. And that kind of made it just even nicer to get to the Angler's Rest. If you want to do the route yourself, then you can download it from our commute account. There's a couple of choices for the route from this one. I've got the one that Steph planned, but then I thought I'd also upload one that I did whilst I was up there that week with Alpkit from their Hadasage store, which is just up the road. And that was a more technical route, I'd say. So a bit of hiker bike and some pretty gnarly descending for a, for a gravel route. So you've got the option of both. Um, the first one with Steph was was fairly mellow and much more sort of entry level. And then you've got the option of a more tricky route. So you can pick and choose, really. Yeah. If you want to take our route as well, but you feel like you want to do an extra sort of 10, 20K, then of course you can do that in Commute and you can just add on a little, little sections around there. So do have a little play with it if you want to extend it. And in addition to the routes in... Uh, the Peak District, obviously you can check out the Second City Divide route on Kamut. So this is another one of the features where you can literally pick up pre-made routes via the collections. So you can browse those. And it's actually one of my um, freelance day jobs, if you like. Side um, Side hustle, whatever you want to call it, um, is that I work with Kamut to upload gravel and mountain biking, long distance trails all over the UK. So it's not just the route, it's really handy information about how to get there, what kind of bike you'll need, what the terrain's like, um, whether there's hotels or guest houses, B&Bs, camping spots, um, all the sort of local highlights and things. Yeah, you can tell uh, I do a lot of this. Um, so we'll put the link to the Second City Divide um, one in there. And if you haven't used Commute before and you'd like to give it a go, um, then they've given you the option to have a free region bundle. So we'll put the instructions for that in the show notes. It's super easy. You just have to make an account and enter the voucher code UNPAVED, all in capitals. And another thing to mention whilst we're talking about free stuff is that we've got a giveaway. So you'll have heard on episode one about Brother Cycles from Will with Brother in the Wild, which is their annual bikepacking weekend uh, sort of mini festival that you've done several times and I'm doing mm. for the first time this year. Mm. So Kamut have given us two tickets to give away. All you have to do to enter is to sign up to our newsletter and we're going to pick at random um, in early March. All the details are on our website for that one. So I hope you've enjoyed listening. Next time... We're in Oxfordshire with the Racing Collective and also chatting to Lachlan Morton over... WhatsApp, I think it was in the end, (laughs) from Australia. That podcast is all about when you take off-road riding to extremes. So the focus of it is GB Duro, which is essentially Land's End to John O'Groats off-road. You might have heard about that. If you did, you'll know that Lachlan, who rides for Rafa EF as a sort of road cyclist, Mm -hmm. but has also been doing lots of off-road stuff, did it super fast. Um, So we're talking a bit about that, but also about... The planning of that ride, the idea behind it, and the experiences of Tom Pro Bear. <laughs> <laughs> You'll understand that when you hear it. Tom Pro Bear riding it, Philippa Batty riding it, and Mars Rezo riding it as well in that podcast. Yeah, Philippa and Miles organising it as well, mm. which is quite something. Yeah, it's, it's a real corker. It wasn't just a ride, it was a, a bike packing overnighter. So a little bivvy in the frost as well, which, yeah, it was probably the coldest night I've had this year. (laughs) But really incredible, incredible experience. So we're looking forward to that one. At some point, we should compare bivvy versus hammock with you at some point, with you being a a hammock advocate. We haven't really done sleeping in detail yet, so we will get to that at some point. But you've been listening for long enough to this episode. So uh, (laughs) until next time. (laughs) Until next time. (laughs) Ta-da!